virtual panel today. I am Daniel Jafari, and I'm the president of Iranian Americans for Liberty, a nonprofit with the aim of advancing the cause of liberty for Iranians with help from Iranian Americans and Americans interested in Iran. I have the pleasure of having Dr. Shervan Fashandi today as my co-host for our event. Shervan, please go ahead and introduce yourself to the few members of the audience who don't know you yet. Good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, depending where you are. And uh, I'm Shervan Fashandi. I'm a board member of Iranian Americans uh, for Liberty and also a member of the Constitutional uh, Party of Iran, CPI, Liberal Democrat, Democratic Party. And uh, as Daniel uh, stated, uh, the goal is to engage the Iranian American community uh, in, in, in the cause for uh, liberty and democracy and uh, secular democracy in Iran. And to that end, uh, we have organized a series of uh, roundtables or panels where every time a uh, few uh, prominent Iranian Americans are invited to uh, participate in our panel. All right, very well. We are both delighted to host star guests who I'm sure will enlighten us with their expertise and insights. First, we have Mr. Shayan Arya, an Iran expert in human rights activists who is extensively published on Iran affairs in major media outlets, including foreign policy um, and provided his opinion to think tanks like Washington Institute for Near East Policy. Mr. Arya is a member of Constitutional Party of Iran. Next, we have Professor Jessica Imami, a sociologist and political commentator. She has an upcoming book on cancel culture titled Cybercrime and Punishment, due to be published in 2021. And last, but certainly not the least, we, have, uh, we welcome Mr. Hamid Salami Mogadam. He's a software industry expert who has graduated as an engineer from Sharif University in Iran, as an, has an MBA from Penn State. In addition, he has worked on global trends, such as global population, international conflict trends at the Center for Global Business Studies at Penn State. Please allow me to express my gratitude to all of you for joining us and welcome you to Iranian Americans for Liberty's virtual panel. I can tell you that there was great interest from online community when this event was announced. And we have lots of feedback and questions from the audience that Sherwin and I will do our best to present to you today. I would like to remind our panelists about the time constraints of today and kindly ask them to respond to each question in five minutes or less so we can get most out of our time. And uh, just a gently reminder that uh, our panelists should refrain from interrupting each other during their allotted time. Uh, now, without further ado, I would like to open the panel by uh, posing the first question. Uh, uh, hopefully, we'll have uh, Hamid to uh, answer first, and then we'll go around. Um, and my question is, uh, how do you think the Islamic Republic's lobby operates inside the United States? Um, in other words, how do they um, push their talking points in favor of the Islamic Republic in uh, both media and cultural institutions and political bodies? Um, and as a follow-up question to that, uh, where do you think they have excelled? Where do you think we can learn from their operation and uh, to take a page out of their playbook? Yes. Uh, first, hello, Mr. Uh, Jaffray and Mr. Fashkandi. And uh, thank you for setting this panel. Uh, I also want to say hello to Ms. Amami and Mr. Arya, who are with me on this panel. And I want to extend my greetings to anybody who is watching this. Um, so I think to answer your question, it's, it's good to have some framework how we think about this. Um, I want to talk a little bit broader than just lobbyists and possible agents of the Iranian regime. Um, I think the broader term is that also we consider people who are sympathizers of the Islamic Republic and also their political allies in the West, people who uh, see them uh, basically as allies because they oppose things they oppose too, um, in particular free market liberal democracies. Uh, to understand that, um, we have to understand the components of uh, this topic and how they interact. And components are one, 
Islamic Republic, you have to understand its nature, its bedrock principles, its leaders, its fractions, um, and as I said, political allies in the West. The second is the United States, uh, the political system in the United States. It's uh, two major parties, elections, uh, public opinion, media. And the third is as how they interact with each other. Uh, so uh, the Islamic Republic is a regime founded in 1979, basically by a radical Shiite clergy named Ayatollah Khomeini. And he started it um, um, by basically nature as an anti-American um, uh, regime. But unfortunately, it had from the beginning some support from the, uh, even before the start of revolution, they had some support from some Western media that uh, always were critical of the uh, uh, past regime. So that those elements are still out there. That's one of the things that they help them. Uh, they help them to create this regime. They help them survive and uh, always blame the West for any you know um, a dispute that exists in between. Um, uh, another thing is that understanding the nature of uh, American politics here. Uh, American politics, because it's a uh, presidential, one-round presidential system. It has turned into a two-party system, and all the alliances happened. Uh, before basically the presidential election. So basically we have two parties, two major political parties. And um, for better or worse, it's, it's a very partisan system and it's become more partisan as people you know, get their news from different sources. Uh, so it, it provides some opportunity for, for the Islamic regime because you know, if you are, uh, if any party take any position you will find uh, a lot of people willingly go to take the extreme position or the uh, opposite position. And if, for example, in this case, Republican get a hard position against the Islamic Republic, you will find some people on the other party who are willing to go ahead and um, basically challenge, in order to challenge their rivals in the United States, defend that region. So these are two elements, like how, how is the nature of the Islamic Republic and how, how the political system in the United States, how that helps them. Uh, and and it's the third interaction, how, how they interact. Um, it's, it's very hard to basically you and I, I think, at least in my position, find out who has financial ties with the, with the Iranian regime. Because I would be very surprised if somebody getting that paycheck, uh, likely it would be uh, they have investment that uh, in Iran they have, and you know, they have family members or uh, trustees that, that there are financial interactions. So for me, it's very hard to you know, find out who, who is financially connected, but it's not hard at all to find out who is uh, basically uh, doing the propaganda of the Islamic Republic here. You can listen to propagandists of the Islamic Republic, um, its media, people are close to uh, leadership of the regime and State Department in particular is foreign minister and see who, is, who are the people who are exactly repeating the same talking points and who are, the, who are exactly also the people who, um, if, if there's a human right abuse in Iran, they make sure that nobody hears it here. If they have access to media, they don't talk about it. If there is anything that is like a PR, they make sure everybody hears it. So they are not necessarily, as I said, lobby in the sense that they get paid, uh, but there are sympathizers of the Islamic Republic, of many of them even, uh, because they see them as a part of the international left, defend the Islamic Republic um, uh, by just you know, propagating its uh, 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 PR talking points. I wanna respect the time of other guests. So it's not Absolutely. Here you I have more time. Yeah, that was that was a that was a great primer for people who are less attuned with uh, how the Islamic Republic uh, pushes their message uh, inside the United States. Uh, so I would like to take that and pose it to uh, Jessica. Um, wh what do you think uh, is their uh, in terms of the Islamic Republic's lobby? What are what are their uh, strong points, and how do you think? they have um, survived for so long inside the United States. Thank you for allowing me to be on this panel. And I enjoyed what 
um, Mr. Salini said. So piggybacking on what he said, which is looking at the broad picture, I also like to take an institutional look at what is going on. And one of the areas where I have more experience is how the regime uses uh, particularly professors in universities and um, cultivates protégés, very, very special people um, that piggyback on the post-colonial and racism narrative here. So the regime is always, for example, if you remember, uh, Khamenei issued a tweet about George Floyd. At the same time, he's slaughtering his own people, but that is for our consumption. And second generation Iranian Americans who are now in universities, uh, they just, they've been told about this post-colonial, anti-colonial narrative which is anything American is imperialist, it's bad. Um, sadly, there is a lot of good reception for this message among the professors who have tenure. So there is sort of this triangle between think tanks, which have a lot of good academics, professors, and the media. Now, how can we interrupt this uh, terrible chain of feedback because the professors have tenure and they're gonna give you that message from here on out. Uh, not only will they do that because they have committees that select professors who have a different viewpoint. Uh, you, you don't tend to see professors who have a viewpoint that is against the human rights violations of the regime or against uh, the solely post-colonial lens instead of something more complicated. We all know Iran is very complicated. It has a lot of ethnicities, a lot of races. So one way I think to interrupt that is considering all the human rights violations that the Iranian regime has committed, particularly in the past two years. Whenever a professor comes up with some kind of post-colonial scholarship that has taken place in Iran, um, we can appeal to our congressmen to ask them to review the funding. We can question the institutional review boards that permit professors to go to Iran with their permission and with their funding and do any kind of research. We all know that there are many professors right now who are being tortured right now at this minute in Evin prison. So we must question, why do American universities allow selective professors to go there with their funding and do research and come back and present this final viewpoint and they have tenure? So this feedback system uh, can be broken in one way, particularly if we keep the focus on human rights violations. Uh, by now we all know that this regime cannot be reformed. And I think a singular focus on their human rights violations, looking at the ethical review boards of every university because they all get federal funding is a very useful thing. And before I close out on this topic, I do wanna also say that there are private foundations that are giving money, for example, to, there's a center for Iranian diaspora studies that has been funded by the Neda Nobody Foundation. They do not uh, cultivate or invite any professors who do not walk that post-colonial line. So we also need to look at where the funding is going for foundations. Think tanks are great, but if we can't get more professors with viewpoint diversity into universities, this problem is not gonna go away. It's just gonna get worse. And with that, I'm gonna close for this question. Absolutely, thank you so much, Jessica. I, I promise this was not rehearsed because uh, it segues very nicely <clears throat> to that. What I was gonna ask uh, uh, Shayan, uh, who is a uh, human rights expert, uh, by pointing out that there are scores of human rights activists, university professors, 
and women's rights activists who are imprisoned in Iran. And where do you think this um, Islamic Republic's lobby uh, have, have fared well in uh, essentially burying out these message and preventing the general public to understand the, the gravity of human rights abuses in Iran? Um, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, before I get to that, I would like to uh, talk about a general um, a framework that they uh, operate. If, if you really think about it, I mean, I Iranians in diaspora, the, the ones who think like us, I, I think they make a fundamental mistake that they only look at this success of uh, regimes, lobbying groups, through the prism of just conspiracy, money, corruption, and things of that nature. But the true picture, I, I believe, is far more sophisticated than that. Uh, Islamic regime and their lobbyists, they understand who their audience is. If you think about it, I mean, they, they go and cater to uh, by and large Democrats and the left in America and in Europe. And if you think about the left and, uh, <clears throat> say, Democrats, what's their main issues? Their main issues is that they want to focus on domestic issues, uh, you know, welfare system, you know, healthcare and all that stuff. They are very skeptical about America's role uh, in the global affairs. They don't want it. They, 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 are, they, they like to American government to focus on domestic issues because they think that uh, America's involvement in global affairs, especially when it's unilateral, it's a distraction for the government to do all the domestic issues and focus on that. It's very costly. And also they, they believe that uh, it's counterproductive. Okay. <clears throat> so Islamic regime uses this worldview. And also the, the, the left and the Democrats, they also believe uh, in, in their ideological framework. They believe in international institutions, say UN, you know, uh, international atomic agencies and all those institutions, global institutions. So Islamic regime uses that and, and kind of uh, cater their message within that framework. For example, <clears throat> It's not uh, accidental that uh, Javad Zarif, in every interview and in every you know, speech that he gives, he brings up, say, 1953 coup uh, in Iran. And, then, and his narrative is, although it's totally wrong, I mean, anyone who studies that and knows about those events knows that his narrative is totally wrong. But why, it, why is it that he continuously repeats that? Because it reinforces that idea of the Democrats and the left that, okay, in 1953, we interfered in Iran's affairs. Even though we were successful, it backfired on us. And now, because uh, uh, Jabal Zarif continuously says, okay, you interfered in our uh, affairs, our people are against that, and all the anti-Americanism you see in Iran at the moment is because of your interference. So it it, it reinforces their preconceived notions. Why is it that, um, that Democrats, for example, they uh, support the <clears throat> uh, nuclear agreement with Iran? And even though they know it's a flawed agreement, why? Because in their worldview, they prefer to have an agreement, international agreement, through international organizations. They prefer a flawed one through that rather than a better one if it's unilateral between America and Iran. They don't like that. So they, they, they support that narrative. So Islamic regime <clears throat> is very successful and are very smart in doing that. They, they frame their uh, narrative within that ideological framework of the left and the Democrats and and even some uh, Republicans who like uh, Rand Paul and, and you know, people like that who are isolationists, they don't want uh, America to get involved in international affairs, they think it's costly, it's, you know, it's not the role of the federal government and all that stuff. So they cater to these type of people and they reinforce their ideologies. And that's why for us, we don't do that. 
uh, unfortunately. We don't, we just give them the message that, okay, you know, uh, Islamic regime is, is a bad regime, it's against, uh, you know, American interests, we should do something about it. But, but it doesn't reinforce their ideology. It doesn't reinforce, it doesn't fit well with them because they're always after, well, okay, you know, we know it's a bad regime, but we, but we shouldn't do anything against it unilaterally. We should work through international organizations. We should do that because they're always afraid that, you know, say some Republicans who want to take a uh, uh, more harsh stand against the Islamic regime, uh, you know, uh, that they're using all these things to achieve their ultimate goal, which is a war with Iran or you know, regime change in Iran or things of that nature. So that's why they are very resistive towards our message. The same thing is with uh, the issue of human rights. I mean, Jessica uh, you know, mentioned that all this post-colonialism and you know, I would add this you know, cultural relativism that is very prevalent in academia and the left and stuff. So again, even though they understand that uh, Islamic regime is violating human rights, but because of this crazy idea of cultural relativism, they say, yes, but who are we to tell them that you know, what they're doing is wrong? You know, it's their culture. We, 300 years ago, we had, you know, four or 500 years ago, we had inquisition in, in Europe, but we gradually, you know, moved on from that. They will eventually move on from this situation too. And, 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 and these are the issues that, you know, we are faced with. These are the realities. And Islamic regime is very uh, uh, smart in exploiting these, you know, ideological frameworks and use those to kind of create an opposition within the West, especially against those who want to, uh, you know, put pressure on them. And that's, that's why it's, uh, it's, in my view, it's far more sophisticated than just, you know, they spend money on politicians or, you know, think tanks or things of that nature. They frame their narrative within that ideological framework of uh, the left and, say, Democrats. I don't know how much more time I have. Of the that, was, that was great. That was great. Thank you, Cheyenne. It was it was, uh, I think it was immensely important to point out that uh, this is uh, a, a, a constructing narrative, uh, if I understood you correctly, that sure. is pivotal in their, in, in their mission. Uh, I would like to take that and pose uh, to Hamed, uh, whom I think for those of you who don't uh, know, Hamed is uh, sort of a specialist and an expert on uh, messaging and narratives. Uh, Hamed, what do you think their points of success um, has been. Some of them, uh, Shaina has already highlighted, but w where do you think they have uh, perhaps have, have, have weaknesses that can be uh, exploited? Couldn't agree with Mr. Ario more on some of the topics he pointed out. I wanted to add the brand quote, he, he did that, that last minute basically, that um, there are two uh, points of view far lefties and uh, there's, there's a point of isolationist. And I find isolationist more consistent than honest because far lefties uh, didn't mind, for example, World War II when Stalin and Hitler had a pact. Then when Stalin was in trouble, um, they just realized uh, that the United States should go to war. So, I mean, they changed their position for the war, you know, depends on who is the Stalin of the time, who is the Pol Pot of the time. Uh, they are very comfortable, you know, to be pro-war, against war, anything that uh, uh, they, they cared about the Vietnamese people. And then as soon as, you know, Communist Party becomes the dominant party and takes over and start killing people and doing concentration camp, then, you know, you know Vietnamese people, whatever. Um, so I find the isolation is a bit more um, honest. Uh, but let's see what's, what's the advantage of far left this hat. So in, in terms of messaging and in terms of flow of idea. So one thing that uh, actually left um, in the United States understand very well is that, talk about slavery. Uh, slavery, I mean, existed in some Southern states, right? And um, then later it, it, you know, there was a war and it ended, but then there was segregationists, right? 
coincidentally, exactly the same states had segregation. So those people were not for slavery, but later, you know, they were for segregation. And, you know, so uh, uh, then um, Jim Crow and so you see that ideas don't die. You, you can't just go to war with ideas and die. Those, you know, backward ideas uh, and wrong ideas and lies that are people's head stay. And you said that what are the advantage? That's their advantage. Um, in 20s and 30s, um, Walter Durante of New York Times was reporting great things about uh, uh, Stalin, right? So a lot of uh, educated city people in the United States, the very Stalinists basically were communist. And uh, I was reading from, I think, uh, work of David Horowitz, who was a communist at the age of 11, who was uh, giving out pamphlets out there. He said that my, my parents never called them a communist, they called them some progressive, never said they were a communist. And uh, they even had a progressive party, you know, separated uh, from the Demo left of the Democratic Party. So these ideas just, just don't go away. Even after the purge, there were divorces among the far lefties, you know, some, but it's still many of them went into uh, new left, what they call them in the, you know, Vietnam War protest as red diaper babies, right? Um, Horowitz, an example of them. Um, uh, so, these people, it's not like they're, it's not like a Stalinist and, you know, far leftist and communist and Marxist just going away. They just morph to something that is a little bit more pleasant, you know, um, in, in seventies when they were brutalizing like the record of Shah of Iran, for example, uh, there were not that much criticism of Pol Pot. Pol Pot, two and a half million in four years, uh, if you do a simple arithmetic, Pol Pot killed more people a day that Shah of Iran killed in 37 years, way more. And even Mr. Chomsky was like, oh, okay, uh, 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 New York Times is going too far. Basically, uh, uh, it's not happening, you know, people are mean to pull both. So this, this is their advantage. For so many years, they've been around and they, they're not gonna change their ideas very easily. The disadvantage they have is that I think they are, uh, in terms of uh, uh, political argument, they have nothing. And um, how it has not been exploited because they don't get challenged. They don't get challenged inside the Democratic Party uh, because until now, at least, they were nothing. They were just some people who go and vote and uh, the centrist Democrat would win everywhere. We'll see what happens now that people congressmen that some of them I like, like Joe Crowley lose to um, a uh, not that famous person, like Cortez. And we'll see what happens now that Elliot Engel loses the seat and th do they see that these far lefties are real danger or not, but they have never been challenged there. And I think Republicans don't challenge them either. Here's my point. I don't think Republicans, well, if you read, there are a guy, there is a guy in Federalist that writes against Marxism, but it's not, it seems that they are more motivated by abortion and things like that uh, than, you know, fighting these bad ideas. And so I think they haven't been challenged. Let me give you an example. I don't want to go over my, I'll just give you one example. I don't think in the Democratic Party, you could see the contrast of two segments that, one segment that I like much better, of course, and I, I feel kind of associated with, um, then in 2016 election between Hillary Clinton that these people smeared so much uh, because of uh, her stance on foreign policy and being tough on some of the uh, uh, regimes like Iran, and Senator Sanders, Secretary Clinton and Senator Sanders. I think two, two sides of the Democratic Party. And you could see that Senator Sanders, and I think even recently, he was defending Castro. He was defending the literacy programs of Fidel Castro. Um, so if you ask Senator Sanders, um, hey, Senator, if literacy programs in Cuba are so important, um, in Costa Rica, they had a literacy program too without killing anybody. And I'm sure people who had uh, gained literacy in Cuba, I don't think they read anything against Castro. They can't read or write against Castro. A literacy program is to read propaganda for Castro, but let these things aside. So if literacy program is that important, what's your take on Augusto, General Augusto Pinochet record? He killed way less than uh, Mr. Um, Castro. He gave up the power. 
uh, economy of Chile was doing the best economy, was best economy of uh, South America for most of the uh, time he ruled and a few years after him, which means what's the good economy means. Let's, let's talk about that. It means people achieve their dreams. Uh, there were better healthcare for a lot of people. Uh, there were less depression. Uh, and uh, when, when you say economy, better economy, people don't see that it act. It means that millions of people lived better. And if it was a door, op door open between Cuba and Chile, we know people would walk from Cuba to Chile and not the other way around. So if you ask Senator Sanders, what's your take? You see the hypocrisy here. Uh, the advantage is that nobody asks. And you saw that this person, as an example, as a figurehead, has been around 30, 40 years. He gains, he gets very good media coverage and gained all his life and, uh, and uh, unchallenged basically the uh, horrifying things he said coming from Soviet Union, giving compliment to chandeliers of Subway and youth programs. Imagine Third Reich was around for six years. Somebody goes to Berlin and come back and talks about their youth programs of all the programs. Hitler so I think <laughs> advantages, they've been around this, uh, and uh, they've been around unchallenged. And the advantage we have is that if we can find a hearing, they basically have nothing to defend. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's the, that was fantastic. I think it's, it, it is helpful, at least for me, to think of the, uh, the, 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 the amount of overlap that there is between the uh, uh, leftists in, in the West and uh, the Islamists uh, uh, in charge in Tehran and how, how they, they, they collaborate and cooperate because they find a common enemy. But I would like to um, switch gears a little bit and ask uh, Jessica, since uh, she actually uh, gave us a, a really great insight uh, with regards to the funding for uh, the, uh, the university professors who would get very favorable uh, uh, looks from, from, from the Islamic Republic and they get to publish um, all these um, fairly um, obscure ideas as to, uh, to, 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 to an, to an um, I would say, unsophisticated um, reader uh, seems like uh, apo uh, apologism. Um, don't you agree, Jessica? Absolutely. And sadly, um, I wouldn't call them so unsophisticated anymore because the discourse of this country is being changed. Uh, we have a lot of uh, public discourse programs now that try to revise our history, revise the history of how capitalism and democracy has given extraordinary opportunities, especially to Iranian Americans. Um, and yet you will hear the second generation uh, talk about themselves as minority victims vis-a-vis -vis the war on terror, you know, without looking on what happened in the war on terror? Why did those policies get enacted? So there's no sophistication or fine tooth comb view. It's just this lens of, you know, if it's Western, if it's capitalist, if it's American, it's exploitative and bad. So um, right now, uh, and I would like to bring back that unless we make inroads into the academy and get some viewpoint diversity in there, it's going to be an uphill battle. Um, there is, there are many professors right now who are trying to, who've actually left the academy because they're frustrated and trying to change the revisionism that we see going on. By revisionism, what do I mean? Like that this country was built on slavery when in fact we know that actually the, the entire hemisphere was engaging in slavery at the time that this happened and that millions of people lost their lives in the United States fighting against slavery during the Civil War. So, um, and then we have something like the 1619 Project by the New York Times, which is rewriting the history of the United States. Uh, in my point of view, I think 
this is one of the very few governments that permits civil rights to flourish over time as our as people become more used to the idea of gradually including new values. But the kind of revisionism that we're seeing right now is being done with the help of the academy. Uh, there is a group of professors that are that have tenure like uh, Steven Pinker and the Heterodox Academy. They have started a new conference for about two years now where they come and present in that setting about what's wrong with all the theories that are floating around unopposed. Um, the same professors also tend to reject anything that opposes their point of view in journals. So professors who do not think the progressive way that Hamed was talking about cannot get published unless they go to a, a conservative and I hate to use labels, a conservative journal, but when there's this kind of divide between, you know, a progressive academics and, you know, outside think tanks, then it's very easy to dismiss those alternative points of view. When in fact, I think they're much more realistic and our students need to be taught those values, especially because we already have a majority minority among young people under 18. I, I believe that minority children outnumber uh, non-minority non children. So it's very important to get different kinds of scholarship out there that complicates the post-colonial and sort of racist narrative that the Islamic Republic loves to ride on and use that commonality to make our people think that, our young people think that they're, they are victims, when in fact they have had incredible resources, their success is undeniable. And the ones who are speaking the loudest in this way have actually gone to the most sophisticated schools, Ivy Leagues, their families are wealthy. And I think that this narrative needs to be complicated a little bit, but we must make inroads into academia. That's, that's great. Uh, so I, I think what I heard is it, it looks like the, uh, the, the, the second generation of uh, uh, Iranians uh, being raised in uh, the uh, prosperous and wealthy society of uh, uh, their, 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 now their uh, homeland sort of have been very receptive to the ideas uh, pushed by the Islamic Republic uh, because it, 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 it resonates with the same messages that they have, they have, they have heard sort of uh, for, the, for the majority of their time in the academia. And, and you think that this is attributed to the fact that the vast majority of uh, academics actually lean either hard left or left, and that that has uh, made them susceptible to, to this messaging. I remember the uh, social media accounts of the Islamic Republic, as you pointed out. I think uh, Mr. Khamenei's, as well as Mr. Zarif, uh, they they were just gleeful looking at American cities burning uh, because of a conflict that has erupted from an, an entirely uh, internal affair but yet they felt that they need to weigh in. Um, I would like to pose to Shion, where, where do you think the, um, the, this, this collaboration, you earlier mentioned that th this is, that we're, we're thinking about them the wrong way and I, I can't agree with you more, that this is not a conspiracy, this, this has deep uh, cultural and societal roots where, where do you think they, they coalesce? Where do you think these um, um, ideas uh, overlap with the, with the ideas of the Islamic Republic as an anti-imperialist anti uh, force fighting the good fight? Well, I, I mean, in terms of uh, America, America, I mean, uh, Tip O'Neill, uh, the late uh, Speaker of the House, uh, used to, has, has a very famous uh, 
saying. He said that all politics are local. So all these people in the academia, in the left, within the Democratic Party, you know, the far left people within America, they, they have an agenda. They want to change the narrative in America. They want to change the policies. They want to change the direction of the country. And within that framework, they support and also ignore the reality. They support anything that, uh, that reinforces their ideas and supports their ideas. And at the same time, they ignore anything that doesn't fit well with that narrative. An Islamic regime uses that. I mean, they talk about, they continuously talk about uh, colonialism. They continuously talk about America's, uh, you know, destructive role in global affairs the, the, and all of that. So, and, and they frame it in this way and it suits the left. And that's why they get support. I mean, they, they don't get direct support. I, I, I don't, they, they get indirect support uh, per se. They, they, I mean, you, you hardly find somebody within the Democratic Party or even the left side of it who uh, publicly and actively support the Islamic regime. They also say, well, you know, this is a bad regime. We agree that, but it's not our business to fix it. Let them do it. And uh, so they, they, they give it direct, indirect support to the Islamic regime. And that's all Islamic regime wants. They want to create a group of people or support a group of people within America and the West and global uh, that kind of resist the other side that wants to put pressure on them. That's all they want. And, and they've been successful uh, in doing that. In, in the academia, uh, you know, uh, the, the same thing is going on. The, I mean, this post-colonial, ideology, this cultural relativism, all these things that are happening within the, you know, academia and uh, they're brainwashing basically all the young people to buy into this false narrative that they're all victims, they're all victims of capitalism, they're all victims of racism, they're all victims of this and that. So it's very important that we um, kind of give the alternative reality. I mean, expose them to this. That's why, for example, I really like and enjoy, say, people like uh, Jordan Peterson. I, I don't know if you guys are familiar with him or not. I mean, he constantly challenges this post-colonial ideology, all this culture, relativism, and someone with his prominence and fame and, you know, uh, even they try to kind of censor him too. I mean, uh, you know, it's, so that's why we have to find, we have to try to find allies like him, talk to them, you know, get to know them, get close to them and through them because he has a huge audience, for example. He has a huge audience globally, not only in, in America, but in Europe, in Canada, you know, uh, elsewhere. I mean, we should identify people like that and try to, you know, present our case and use their voice, use their resources, use their influence in order to enhance our uh, agenda and our, you know, the reality that we want to present to the people. So we, we should do that. I mean, other than that, as Jessica said, it's a very uphill battle because, you know, uh, the academia won't listen to us. But I give you one example. There was a professor um, a few years ago um, that had read one of my articles and he found my email and sent me an email. He said that I really enjoyed it and I really agree with you. Uh, and uh, is there anything I can help you with, you know, and things of that nature. And I said, you know, well, thank you very much. You know, it's wonderful to uh, hear from you. Uh, if you can for, for example, some venues within your university that we can come and talk to your students about exactly what's going on in Iran. He said that it's very difficult to do it. They won't let me. Wow. Yeah. 
it, I mean, I was just blown away. I said, you know, I can support you. I can, I, I really sympathize with what you are saying, but it's very difficult in this atmosphere to uh, have a venue uh, for people who are not falling in. I may have uh, lost uh, Shayan. Uh, can you hear me, Shervan? Yes, I hear you. Yeah, there was a little bit of uh, technical issues. Okay, okay. Can you hear yeah. me now? Yeah, yes. Yeah. I think we just uh, caught the very last bit, uh, but uh, the, I think what, what I, I was just blown away uh, by the fact that someone who took the trouble to email you and personally thank you for your uh, uh, piece, uh, but still felt uncomfortable uh, at least allowing your uh, th their their uh, students to be exposed to your ideas. Uh, that's just uh, it, it, it was the university, right? It was right. The establishment within the university, not him. He said, "I no, would no. love to do it, but yeah. it would it, there would be consequences." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wow. Wow. Shervan, do you want to? Uh, I, I, I hate to be the, 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 the sole uh, host, so I, I would let you uh, take up the, the next question. Sure. <clears throat> so I've been following the discussion uh, of, from the, all three panelists, and uh, I think they convincingly covered the double standard that we see in the, uh, in the uh, horrific uh, human rights abuses, uh, let's say, uh, in Iran compared to Saudi Arabia. Like we all remember uh, Jamal Khashoggi's uh, uh, slaughter and, and uh, all the scandal that uh, followed that. And it rightfully so, I believe, rightfully so, it resulted in huge political, even economic cost for, for Saudi Arabia. And hopefully all that international pressure may lead to some meaningful reform there. But since then, the regime, uh, has committed much more atrocities uh, in terms of executing political prisoners, um, kidnapping and assassinating uh, dissidents and uh, and uh, journalists in outside Iran, in Turkey, uh, in in Iraq, and if you follow the mainstream media in the West, not much of coverage, practically zero coverage. I can say in, in many cases, many cases which were comparable to uh, Khashoggi or even w worse than, than Jamal Khashoggi's case. So uh, we all discussed it here. Some of it could be vestiges of, of the Cold War mindset where allies of, of the West or, or US, uh, if there are human rights issues, uh, human rights violations, it, get, it must get magnified in, in the eyes of uh, mainstream media and, and the left. Uh, all the human rights abuses in allies of, uh, of the West must get magnified by tenfold. But if anti-imperialist regimes uh, commit much more horrendous uh, human rights violations, then uh, for the most part, it can be ignored or whitewashed or, or uh, minimized. So I think we, we, we already discussed that, but uh, the last thing I wanted to uh, bring up and ask uh, for all three panel from all three panelists to uh, cover it before they conclude their remarks is uh, the diversity of, of, uh, of areas uh, or institutions uh, that the regime apologists and, and pseudo lobbies have infiltrated. So I've listed, uh, I've listed some, Obviously, one that we discussed extensively is academia, uh, but I rather also I rather uh, bring up think tanks we we, we, we touched on, and uh, also Democratic Party we discussed it. The other area I, I believe is deep states, uh, deep states, uh, and and the government agencies because we know that when uh, the uh, when election happens and the cabinet changes, not all levels of the government change. So. 
uh, I think that's that would be nice to discuss maybe either today or, or uh, in another session. Also, human rights uh, organizations, uh, we know that how they, they intentionally or, or maybe uh, instinctively uh, cover for, for the regime atrocities or minimize it. And, uh, and, and any other area. So the mainstream media would be another one. And I think each area requires a different strategy, a strategy of its own. Uh, so I think like we start with Hamid. Uh, in terms of all the institutions and what strategy fits which area to uh, combat the infiltration of the regime. Absolutely. I think it's Before the, I, I'm sorry to interrupt you, Hamid, but uh, just one uh, minor housekeeping issue. Since uh, we are uh, getting near toward their end, uh, I'm trying to kind of budget the time. I would say if you, you guys would have about five to seven minutes and uh, if you can kindly both respond to Sharon's question as well as your closing remarks, that would be great because that way we'll have everyone's uh, input. Thank you. Sure, sure, I'm gonna do that in five minutes. So Sharon, it was a, a really good question and very broad. So I try to uh, um, basically say what I think about this. All these things happen, uh, or most of them happen with what basically Professor Emami was pointing out. Basically, if you have a uh, production of these people, they're gonna go get jobs. You know, you said a deep state, whatever, the Department of State, what, CIA, whatever. Well, when you have a production line, these people are going to get a job. And uh, so that, that's the first thing. And uh, it's out of my area of expertise. But it's obvious that, you know, these people are not going to just uh, be on Twitter. Uh, although we'll be on Twitter in the afternoon. But, <laughs> but not in the morning. So uh, that's one thing. Um, another thing is that I strongly believe um, um, and, uh, that if you look at your average democratic voter is not on foreign policy, that person doesn't think like Senator Sanders. I absolutely don't believe so. If you see all the polls, um, you know, Republicans and Democrats have a very skewed view of each other. And that's very good for people who want to do, take advantage of the partisanship here. And for Islam Islamic Republic people are those people who want to take advantage and we should not be fooled by that. An average democratic voter is a proud American and um, uh, is, it cares about human rights abuse. And uh, uh, because they, they don't, because of the media that is partisan, they don't hear our side. But actually, I think we have a real threat to these far lefties, unlike, for example, uh, say, Cuban immigrants. And I tell you why, because Cuban immigrants, by nature, many, there was a dominant you know, Catholic factor among them, which is completely fine. My wife's family is Catholic, I have nothing against it. I'm just saying that um, um, they are not necessarily socially liberal. Um, and uh, by an average Cuban immigrant, not necessarily socially liberal person. So uh, they were not a very good fit for you know socially liberal people people who are in democratic party because of social liberalism and is a lot of people are there for that and most of us are socially liberal so i think we have this advantage over for example cuban immigrants that we are we are actually on social policy many of us at least are aligned with the democratic party and we're going to be uh pain in the neck for these people for these far lefties because um a lot of things about the uh, right wings they, t they tell us, like about gay rights. Or, uh, I was defending gay rights when I was in college in Iran. People will call me pervert because I'm saying that these people just should have the right. So they, do, they can't like get away with that. So I think we should just be there. And uh, just those of us who feel still um, at least with part of the Democratic Party comfortable and say that um, the direction of party is wrong. And we should point out that, well, for example, again, back to Senator Sanders, he calls uh, uh, Crown Prince of Saudi as murderous talk, like killing a person. Over, over the last two years, Islamic Republic had killed 1,500 people in the street, executed people, et cetera, et cetera. At what point, at what number, Senator, or people like him will call these people murderous talks? Is there a number? 
Is it 5,000? Is it 10,000? So you can push pressure on them. You can push uh, public opinion on them. And the last thing I want to say before I close is that do not underestimate, do not underestimate what we can do with people in Iran, with public opinion people in Iran. Because here you have to explain who is who, who is the liberal, who is, because these people are not really liberal in classical term, of course. Uh, many of them uh, actually, uh, we, we went with college with these people and we know these people, right? They are pro-regime, pro-regime that is for gay, gay execution, etc. In Iran, you don't have this problem. We don't have this problem in Iran showing that who these people are. And that, when public opinion in Iran knows who these people are and what they do, and you don't need to do anything. You don't need to smear them or anything. You just need to translate what they say. Just think they say in English, you just translate them. And do not underestimate that the waves that it will create. Uh, public opinion works in mysterious ways. Basically, when people know them, there will be, in particular now with you know, social media, et cetera, you will see that um, there will be a heat, I promise you. So we need to be patient, do the right thing, and be persistent. Thank you for your time. That was great. That was great. I'm going to steal that quote from you. Uh, public opinion works in mysterious ways. <laughs> Jessica. I think you're still on mute. Got it. Um, I really enjoyed what Hamid said, which is that the picture of an actual person is much more complicated than the narratives that the Islamic Republic loves to pander to, to the people here. Uh, there are some areas of there are some areas of optimism and, and we have to stay optimistic to be able to keep going. So one of the areas is, we haven't really talked about this, but the, the regime piggybacks on the sentiments here of people who overblow the narrative of Islamophobia and uh, also sadly form a majority of the uh, Muslim lobbies not the actual Muslims in this country who are, at least in my experience, the Iranians are largely secular. Um, so one of the areas that was, is sort of a area of optimism is in the state of California, I think it was the, um, the legislature there mandated ethnic studies curriculum that were largely pushing this narrative of that there's Islamophobia everywhere and uh, Muslims are being vilified and victimized. Now, if you think about it, a lot, 60% of the Middle Easterns of California are people who ran away from the Islamic Republic. So when the legislator presented in this uh, public uh, process that they have, this comment process, the curriculum, 13 organizations that were Middle Eastern, Assyrians, Armenians, Zoroastrians, they all got together and formed a coalition. Those groups normally are very quiet because they're used to living as minorities. But when they saw the curriculum that was going to be taught to their own children about their own history, they drew the line. They said, we have to speak up. And thus, something was born, a coalition was born. And we need to keep trying to push these coalitions. And going on what Hamid said, another point of, I think, light inside Iran that sort of piggybacks on this is that uh, a survey by the Boruman Foundation and also some previous ethnographic studies have shown that the youngest generation of Iranians who were not present for the revolution really are very tired of their government. They do not want the Islamic Republic. They do not want Khamenei. They want a secular democracy. And they are a receptive audience. There is a new synergy that can be built there. Uh, my only point of worry is that that coalition in California of all the Middle Easterns in, uh, in California, they managed to get the governor to veto the ethnic studies for K through 12, 
but what's going missing is that the college curriculum has slipped. That's going to be approved and it's very, that worries me as an, as an academic. But there is a lot we can do with young people if we speak up, if we coalesce, if we show people that Iran is much more complicated, much more diverse than what the uh, Mullah regime is trying to, to show. Um, along those lines, I have started a program called the Farangis of Iran, where I just get everyone that I know, I know probably about 5,000 people who are Farangis who lived in Iran, foreigners who developed a love for Iran, who have a lot of affinity, um, but they haven't been able to go back. So what I do is like five, 10 minutes, I get their best stories. What was your opinion about Iran? Just getting their oral history and putting it on YouTube, it really defeats that idea that the foreigners who were there were bad, you know, bad people doing bad things and that the, you know, Iranian people are all Islamist and it just totally complicates that narrative. So where we can speak up, we really need to speak up and we need to coalesce to, to uh, defeat those messages that are orchestrated by the government of Iran. Terrific, terrific. Uh, I'm, I'm really fascinated that I, I will definitely follow up on uh, that project. And uh, I think it's, it's a very uh, nice way of uh, uh, finishing up on, on a positive note. Uh, Shayan, any uh, comments uh, with regards to Sherwan's question and uh, perhaps uh, closing? Uh, no, I just wanted to, I mean, uh, just really put emphasis on one thing, that in terms of think tanks, even the left ones, even the ones who support this uh, globalist narrative, uh, we, we can uh, persuade them by showing the true nature of the Islamic regime, that how this regime is a revisionist uh, uh, regime. They want to overthrow the established uh, world order. They, they, they are trying to undermine indirectly all the in international institutions that the left kind of care about. We, we should expose all these things and hopefully it will work out. In addition to what Jessica was saying that, you know, contacting all these coalitions in California and other places, encourage people to speak up and just don't be, you know, passive about all these things. We, we, we should be able to, if we do all these things at the same time and uh, be proactive, uh, I think we can make a good impact. It's, it's, a, it's an uphill battle. It requires a lot of time, energy, money, and, you know, all that stuff that which, unfortunately, <laughs> we, we lack. But at the same time, with whatever little resources we have, if we do it correctly, if we focus uh, our efforts on, on you know, particular, uh, you know, areas, I think we can make uh, a, a very good impact and, you know, change a lot of minds and, you know, uh, at least, uh, you know, stop uh, the enhancement of, you know, Islamic regime's agenda within uh, American political system and, uh, you know, academia and all that stuff. We, we can make a difference, but it's, it's an uphill battle and uh, we just have to be smart about what we do and how we frame our uh, message, uh, cater it to uh, the audience that we are targeting, uh, make sure that we understand what's important for them and kind of frame our uh, you know, agenda to suit their uh, overall ideology and you know, something that appeals to them. We unfortunately don't do that. And uh, we should learn to do it better and do a better job with, uh, of doing that. If we speak their language, we can make a much better impact than just telling, telling them, okay, this is what it is. This is what, you want, what we want you to do. And this is the right thing to do. If it doesn't fit their overall ideology and framework, uh, I mean, uh, framework of their ideology and worldview, they're not gonna listen to us. So we should cater our message to suit them. And if we do that, uh, we can make a big difference. 
That's all. That That was great. That was great. I think uh, I I have, uh, I I would say it's a very informative panel. I've learned a lot. I'm sure um, audience uh, had a lot to take in uh, for the past hour or so. Uh, It sounds to me uh, that there is uh, a formidable opponent in front of us in the form of uh, the uh, Islamic Republic's lobby, who is in a very close alliance with uh, the, the vast swaths of the hard left and a considerable chunk of the leftist or left of the center uh, of the political spectrum in the United States. And, uh, but what I'm also hearing from all our panelists, panelists is that we, we, we have uh, a lot room to grow. We have to uh, hopefully gear toward getting the, uh, the attention of the general public, both inside the United States as well as uh, in Iran, uh, by finding uh, lasting um, allies. And uh, I love the, uh, uh, the, the reference to Heterodox Academy, I think, uh, it, that would be one area that can um, easily be uh, harvested, and I think this is another uh, point that we have to we have to focus on. Uh, so overall, I I I, I really love that we, we ended up on a high note. Uh, Sherwan, any uh, parting words? Uh, no, that's it. I just wanted to thank all three panel, panelists for uh, taking the time, participating in uh, the discussion, and also thank the audience. Hopefully, some of the audience will be panelists in future uh, in future roundtables very very soon. That would be great. Thank you, everyone, for giving us your time uh, in on this uh, beautiful sunny uh, Sunday afternoon, and uh, we will um, hope to see you very soon. Thank you. Thank you.